Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm the least brainy speaker you're going to have today. So uh, I'm going to spend one moment just trying to talk about what I do and, and put it in context for you. So the research that I do is aimed at explaining what we call inductive leaps. That is, the inferences that people make that go beyond the data that they have to evaluate underdetermined hypotheses. So these are things like making predictions about the future, inferring causal relationships, identifying the work of chance, interpreting things like words and sentences, discovering the meaningful features of objects, or learning complex things like uh, functions, languages, or concepts. So in each of these cases, uh, the problem that we face is an inductive problem. We get some data, we need to go beyond those data. For example, we might observe some objects interacting and then try and infer the latent relationships that exist among those objects. So studying these kinds of problems is interesting, not just from the perspective of psychology, where we might hope to understand how it is that people do all of these amazing things, but also from the perspective of computer science, because these are all problems that people solve better than computers. So, you know, despite the fact that significant advances are being made in artificial intelligence and machine learning research, at the moment, human beings set the standard for solving all of these problems. And that means that if we can make good mathematical models of how people make these kinds of inductive leaps, that's something that can inform artificial intelligence and machine learning as well. So, the goal of the research that I do then is to try and find what the mathematical principles are that characterize human inductive inference. But as soon as you start to explore that question and read a bit of philosophy or a bit of machine learning research, you discover that the only thing that you can do to become better at solving inductive problems is to have better inductive biases. That's a term that comes from machine learning. It means all of the things other than the data that influence the hypothesis that you select. So an inductive bias is something which leads you to favor one hypothesis over another, which is necessary because in these inductive problems, you're essentially making guesses about what the true situation is. So uh, those inductive biases uh, have to be something which is aligned with the structure of the problems that you're solving. So human beings then do a good job of solving these inductive problems because we have inductive biases which are good for the kinds of problems that we have to solve. And to give you an example of that, uh, here's one inductive problem. This is a word learning problem. I'm going to teach you guys a, a word in Australian. Um, uh, I know at least one person here speaks Australian, so if you speak Australian already, please don't spoil it for everybody else. Okay, so this is a, a, a jumbuck. Okay, so now this is an audience participation moment. I want you guys to tell me what you think jumbuck means. Okay, good, great, okay. So uh, that is in fact correct. The word jumbuck appears in the song Waltzing Matilda, if you, you know, have heard it somewhere before. There are lots of other fun Australian words in that song I can tell you about later. Um, uh, so, uh, and jumbuck does mean sheep, right? So in that song, the tucker man put the, uh, sorry, the, the swagman put the, uh, Jumbuck in his tucker bag and then that kicked off a whole bad situation, right? So uh, what was interesting about that inference that you made though was that not just you, you got the right answer but you didn't necessarily even consider many of the other possible answers. So there's lots of other answers that are equally consistent with the data that I provided to you, right? Jumbuck could mean something less than three feet tall, it could mean something in contact with the earth, it could mean a white thing, it could mean uh, something which you can uh, eat if you're not a vegetarian, it could mean uh, something contained within the earth's gravitational well, it could mean, you know, something which, uh, say, on a, uh, on, a, on a Wednesday, is a sheep, but on any other day of the week is a glass of milk, right? Those are, those are all possibilities that were equally consistent with the evidence that I provided to you, but none of those possibilities entered your mind when uh, you were asked that question. And the reason why is that you have good inductive biases for learning words, right? You as an adult human being have learned lots of words, you have expectations about the kinds of things that words describe, and you have expectations about the kinds of things that Australians want to talk about, right? And as a consequence, you were able to make a really good guess here. So those inductive biases are what guided you to these good solutions. If we had a computer trying to solve the same problem, they wouldn't necessarily have the benefit of those same inductive biases. So what we want then is a mathematical framework that allows us to describe solutions to inductive problems and allows us to talk about inductive bias. And so in my lab, what we do is uh, explore the possibility that this doesn't require new math, Rather, it's something we can solve using old math, math that was brought to us by this guy, the Reverend Thomas Bayes, a nonconformist minister who lived in England in the 18th century. So I'm sure everyone here has seen Bayes' rule before, but you might not have seen it presented as a theory of inductive inference. If you see it in a statistic class, it might seem kind of boring. Here, I'm trying to convince you that it's really exciting and the fundamental solution to the kinds of problems that I've been talking about. So 
Bayes' rule tells us how it is that a rational agent should go about updating their beliefs about some hypotheses if they're willing to express the degrees of belief in those hypotheses in terms of probabilities. So it says, uh, if you have a prior probability for a hypothesis, that is how much you believe that hypothesis to be true, uh, then you can calculate a posterior probability for that hypothesis, how much you should believe it to be true after observing data, D, uh, by taking the prior probability and multiplying it by a likelihood and the likelihood is just what the probability would be uh, of those data being observed if that hypothesis were true. So assume the hypothesis is true, how likely is it that you see the data that you saw, right? And then you normalize this by summing over the space of all of your hypotheses. So for the case of my language learning problem, for example, where you were learning that, that uh, new word, the hypotheses that you have would be about the possible things that that word could mean. The data that you get is me labeling that image as an instance of a jumbuck, and then you are calculating a posterior probability distribution over those hypotheses. So this gives us a kind of framework for thinking about how to go about formalizing the solutions to these inductive problems, uh, but it also gives us something which is a, a powerful tool for exploring inductive bias which is that if we look at the right-hand side of this equation, there are two terms here, and only one of those terms features the data, right? So the prior probability here is what you believe about hypotheses in the absence of data, and that's something which captures the inductive biases of the agent. Remember I said inductive biases, all those things other than the data which lead you to favor one hypothesis over another, well, here that's captured in this prior probability distribution. So that sets up a research program which is one of seeing to what extent we can use this kind of framework to make sense of the way in which people behave, and then uh, looking across a range of different kinds of problems, and then seeing if we can characterize what people's inductive biases are in terms of these prior probability distributions over hypotheses. And using that framework, we get results which, because they're expressed in this mathematical uh, form, allow us to then translate what we see in human behavior over to something that we can simulate on a computer. So the way that uh, I've been talking about this problem so far is kind of using this sort of schema for learning where we think about data being provided to us by the world and then the learner forming hypotheses about uh, those data. But in fact, for most of the things that you know, uh, you didn't learn those things by having direct experience with the world where you went out and manipulated and performed experiments and sort of worked out what the truth was. Rather, you learned those from data that were provided to you by other people, right? So uh, when I just taught you what a jumbuck was, right, that was something which you were able to learn from data that I was generating for you. So uh, it's interesting to ask what happens if we take this formal framework and look at it in the context of this kind of learning, where you're learning not just from the world, but, but from other people. Uh, and one thing that's particularly interesting about this form of learning is that if you're learning from other people, those people in turn had to learn from somebody else and so on and so on and so on. Right? And this defines a process which we call iterated learning. Uh, this has been looked at in the context of language evolution. You could think about a language as being something which is passed from learner to learner to learner. Uh, and uh, you, know, you learn language from someone who learned language from someone who learned language and so on and so on and so on. And a natural thing to ask in this context is what the consequences might be of learners learning from other learners. Okay, so uh, I've now talked about two things that seem like they might be quite distinct. On the one hand, a story about you know, how it is that we can try and identify what makes people good at solving inductive problems. On the other hand, a question about what it is that happens as information is being passed along these chains of learners. And what I'm going to talk about today is how it is that those two ideas come together. So while the way uh, that we traditionally might study learning looks more like this, where we're focused on individuals and trying to work out how it is that uh, they're forming hypotheses about the world, what I'm going to argue is that, in fact, we can learn more about individual cognition by looking at scenarios like this. So I'm going to make an argument that uh, thinking about these cases of how information changes as it's transmitted from person to person actually gives us an even more powerful tool for identifying inductive biases and understanding something about individual cognition than the traditional methods that we have used as psychologists. OK? Sounds good? Yeah? OK. So. Uh, the way I'm going to do this is talk about these two things in turn. First of all, start out talking a little more about Bayesian inference. I'm going to give you a concrete example of a problem that we can analyze in these terms, and then hopefully that'll help you understand a little more about prior distributions and so on, but also illustrate that it's not completely crazy to think about modeling people's behavior in these terms. And then uh, I'll switch uh, and start talking about cultural evolution and how this relates to these questions that I started out with. So the problem of Bayesian inference that I'm going to use is a problem that we call uh, predicting the future. <laughs> 
So this is another audience participation moment. I'm going to ask you guys some questions. I need you to yell out some answers, OK? Uh, so uh, a movie has made $90 million so far. That's all that you know about it. You just hear it's made $90 million. How much money do you think it's going to make in total? More guesses? I want to hold distribution here. So, Good? OK, great. All right. Uh, movie's made $6 million. How much do you think it's going to make? OK? This is, I said audience participation, guys. You're the audience. <laughs> OK. All right, good. All right. Uh, so you meet a 90-year-old man. Uh, what would you estimate for his total lifespan? <laughs> this, is, this is always a little awkward if there's someone in the room who's 90. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. uh, so what are your, your guesses? 90. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, you meet a six-year-old boy. What's your estimate for his total lifespan? Okay, good. All right, so as you probably noticed, right, I gave you the same numbers here, 90 and 6, in these two different scenarios, but the answers that you gave me were quite different, right? So we were getting guesses like 140, 150 here, um, maybe 10, 12 here. Uh, this was 93 maybe, uh, and here something like 80, right? So uh, we could ask what's going on, right? Why is it that you're making different predictions in those different situations? In order to answer that question, what we want to do is analyze this predicting the future problem. Um, and the way I'm going to analyze it is in terms of uh, a problem where we say you're given t, the elapsed duration or extent of a phenomenon. What you're trying to infer is t total, the total duration or extent of a phenomenon. And the question is, what should we guess for t total given t? OK. So, uh, it might not come as a surprise that we can formulate this problem as a problem of Bayesian inference, right? So what we want to do is calculate our posterior distribution over t total, given the observed value of t. And we're going to do that by taking the product of the likelihood, the probability of seeing that value of t, t if t total, uh, given the particular value of t total, multiplied by the prior probability of that value of t total. Uh, and in order to simplify things a bit, what I'm going to do is assume that the way we're going to get our likelihood is by saying, you encounter this phenomenon at a point which is uniformly distributed over the range in which it occurs. Right? So if you meet the 90-year-old man, you are meeting him at a point which is uniformly distributed over his whole lifespan. Right? So if he's going to live to 93, then the probability that you meet him in his 90th year is 1 out of 93. Okay? So that simplifying assumption gives us our likelihood. And then all we need to worry about is what the prior should be for these different phenomena. So I'm going to talk about three different prior distributions. Um, so these prior distributions characterize very different kinds of uh, forms that, that we can see for the distribution of everyday quantities. So one of these distributions is a power law distribution. So a power law distribution is a distribution which is relatively invariant to scale. So it says, you know, it doesn't make sense to measure things in terms of, uh, you know, uh, say hours or minutes or days. There's not a, a natural scale for that phenomenon. Um, and it has this property where it sort of falls off very quickly, but then has a very long tail here. What that means is that extreme events uh, can still occur with relatively high probability. So something that follows this kind of distribution is wealth, right? So uh, if you um, uh, sort of look at the form this distribution has, it says most people don't have very much money, but there are a few people like Bill Gates who have lots and lots of money, right? That's a power law distribution. Uh, that's quite different from, say, a Gaussian distribution, which has some central tendency and then uh, falls off rapidly on either side of that central value. So something that follows this kind of distribution is height, right? Uh, so you know, there's some sort of average height, and then things fall off rapidly on either side. Uh, height is quite different from wealth. So if height followed the same kind of distribution as wealth, then every day you would walk past someone who's 100 feet tall. Right? And somewhere on Earth, there'd be someone who's 5,000 feet tall, who's like the Bill Gates of height. Right? Um, uh, uh, and then the third distribution is this Erlang distribution, which kind of has a bump and then falls off. Right? That's a pretty technical uh, explanation. But uh, you know, it sort of goes up and then goes down again. It goes down less quickly than the Gaussian, but faster than the power law. Right? And it's a kind of thing that you get when you have sort of two processes that might be working against one another. One which is a, a process which kind of makes larger values more likely, and another which is a process that makes larger values less likely. And so if that process that makes larger values less likely is sort of stronger than the one that makes them more likely, you get a bump, and then you get a, a fall off in the end, which is exactly what we see here. So something that follows this distribution is um, the amount of time people spend in the US House of Representatives. Right? So uh, 
that's something where incumbency might give you a sort of advantage for sticking around, but you know, there's also a process where every time you're up for election, there's a chance that you get kicked out. Right? Okay. So these three different distributions result in different kinds of predictions. And the way that we can calculate this is by saying, take this distribution as your prior probability distribution, and then uh, apply Bayes' rule. You get a posterior distribution. From that posterior, we'll pick the point where it's 50%, uh, there's a 50% chance that the true value is greater than that, and a 50% chance that the true value is less than that. So we take the median of the posterior distribution. So, that posterior median then, we can plot out as a, as a function of t. So here's t, this is the, the value that we observe, and then here's the prediction that we should make t star, which is gonna be the median of the posterior distribution. So if you have a power law prior, then the prediction function here is a linear function, has a zero intercept and a, a, and a slope which is greater than one. So if you have, say, this black line here, which is called the uninformative prior, it's the one that says we know absolutely nothing about this phenomenon, uh, then the prediction function that you get is one that says uh, you should predict that it'll go on for uh, twice as long as it's gone on already, right? So if you know absolutely nothing about a phenomenon and how it's distributed, then the best prediction you can make is that it'll, it'll sort of last as long again as it lasted already, right? Um, and this is something that's called Gott's rule. It's named after an astrophysicist, Richard Gott, uh, who suggested that we could use this rule for making predictions. Um, but for other power laws, we get something which is still a linear function, just with a different slope here. For a Gaussian prior, we get something which uh, is basically saying predict the mean until you get close to the mean, and then predict something which is just a little bit longer than things have gone on already. And for an Erlang prior, we get a prediction function which says uh, predict that, so here we have again a linear function, it has a, a slope of one and a non-zero non intercept, so it says predict that something will go on for a little bit longer than it has, regardless of how long it's gone on already. So regardless of how long that process has continued, you just make a prediction that it's gonna last a little bit longer, okay? So uh, to solve the mystery of why you made those different predictions for the, uh, the grosses of movies and human lifespans, the grosses of movies follows a power law distribution. Right? Uh, so something like a power law. Most movies don't make very much money. Some movies make lots and lots of money. The Titanic made a titanic amount of money, right? Uh, so we have a distribution that's kind of like this. And as a consequence, the prediction function you should use is a multiplicative one. And if you do the math, you should be multiplying by about 1.4 or 1.5. So if it's made $90 million, it'll make about $140 million, right? And I think we had guesses that were in that range. If it's made $6 million, it'll make about 10. Again, we had guesses in that range. Um, Human lifespans follow a Gaussian distribution, right? So the six-year-old boy, you should predict the mean lifespan, and then the 90-year-old man has gone past the mean, so you should predict a little bit longer, right? And that's exactly what you did. Uh, and you know this Erlang distribution, I said that that characterizes how long people spend in the US House of Representatives. The fact that they should be making a prediction that they'll only stay there a little bit longer regardless of how long they've been there might help to explain why our US politicians are sort of crazed about raising money rather than necessarily governing, right? Okay. So uh, if you uh, wanted to take that you know, experiment that we ran here, looking at the predictions that you make, uh, and turn it into something more formal, then uh, we actually did this. This is with Josh Tenenbaum in 2006. What we did was take a bunch of these different quantities, things like the grosses of movies, the length of poems, human lifespans, the run times of movies, uh, how long people have served in Congress. Uh, we collected the distributions for these quantities, and we identified whether they were power law, Gaussian, or Erlang. Um, and then we asked people to make predictions where we basically used a survey, and on the survey people would see five different uh, everyday quantities. They'd make a prediction where uh, they'd be given a, a single value of t, uh, for each of those quantities and then make a prediction about the corresponding value of t total. And then we can collect those data across our participants and then look at what kinds of predictions they're making and whether those predictions are sensitive to the differences in these different kinds of priors and whether they're sensitive to the actual statistics of those distributions. So this is showing the results of our experiment. Uh, so on the top here are those five distributions that we collected. This is, we basically went online and we found databases and we took the data from those databases and crunched the numbers. The gray bars show the empirical distributions of those quantities. Um, the red lines are the best fitting members of the different parametric families that I mentioned. And then down here are the predictions. So the black line is the predictions you get using the histogram. The red line is the predictions you get using the parametric family. And the, uh, the black dot here is the median of 40 people's judgments, around 40 people for each of these dots, 
uh, judgments for, um, uh, for these different quantities. And then the error bars show a 68% confidence interval. So what you should be able to see is that the predictions that people make are different for these things that have different kinds of distributions. They track the differences in those distributions well, and they actually seem to track the statistics of those distributions pretty well too. Okay? So this is a case where using our Bayesian models, we can sort of give a pretty good account of what it is that's happening when people are predicting the future. We can say the way people predict the future is consistent with the predictions of these Bayesian models. Um, and we can also do a pretty good job of recovering information about what kinds of prior distributions might inform those predictions. So in this case, the prior distributions we have are just over a one-dimensional quantity. From that, we can derive a different prediction function for a different prior. And as a consequence, we can diagnose what prior people might be using by looking at the prediction functions that they use. Right? And in this case, we can find that those prediction functions are consistent with appropriate priors. You can also use this as a tool for diagnosing what kind of prior distributions people might have for other quantities. For example, we also ask people uh, this question. We said, you know, you've been on hold for 20 minutes. How much longer do you think you're going to be on hold on the telephone, right? Uh, and when we did that, we found that people made predictions which were a linear function with a slope greater than 1. So they had a power law prior for how long you're going to be on hold. If you've been on hold for 20 minutes, then you're probably going to be on hold for, you know, another 10 or 15 minutes. If you've been on hold for 30 minutes, then, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, and so on and so on and so on, right? So we could make an inference about what kind of prior distribution people might have. So this kind of methodology is something that we'd like to be able to use to answer those deeper questions about what people's inductive biases are for complex things like functions, languages, and concepts. But the problem is that as soon as you go beyond something like this one-dimensional example, the space of prior distributions becomes much larger. Right? If you think about something complex like a concept or something complex like a function, there are all sorts of distributions you could imagine defining over those. And the kinds of responses that we get from people are complex themselves. And so it doesn't seem like we can necessarily use the same methodology to try and identify what people's inductive biases are like going beyond these simple sorts of examples. So uh, that's what encourages me then to talk about the second part of this talk, which is a, uh, a methodology which we developed for solving that problem of identifying what kinds of priors people might have, but one which emerged from answering a very different kind of question, a question about what happens when we look at uh, when information is transmitted from person to person. Okay, so is everybody okay on Bayesian inference, predicting the future? Yeah. Can you make a comment about the like, flat likelihood that you assumed? The uniform, yeah. So, yeah, in this experiment, it doesn't make much difference whether you assume that uniform distribution or something which is kind of like it, or even if you assume you're just truncating the distribution. It makes a small difference in terms of how these predictions come out. Um, we've run other experiments which more directly test that assumption. Uh, which show that, um, so one of the predictions that that makes is if you get multiple observations of a phenomenon, then you, you should sort of gradually decrease the amount that you generalize beyond the largest value. And so we've done experiments where we show that people do something like that. So, okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So, so are you saying that um, humans are infer things based on their uh, statistical experience on that beforehand? Uh, I could be saying something like that. So I haven't, I haven't, I haven't talked here about uh, what sorts of mechanisms would support these kinds of inferences, right? So I've just been saying people are behaving in a way which is consistent with Bayesian inference, right? And that's kind of where I'm stopping right now, right? So, um, you know, in terms of the levels of analysis that, uh, that Thiele talked about earlier, right? Uh, this is a computational level story. It says, here's a characterization of the structure of the problem that's being solved, what the ideal solution is, and then demonstration of behavior which is consistent with that ideal solution. So you can ask a question which is, you know, what mechanisms, what cognitive processes could allow people to be solving this problem in a way which is consistent with Bayes? Uh, if you want to ask that question, I can answer it at the end of the talk. Does that sound OK? Yeah. yeah? OK. Other questions? All right. All right, good. OK, so let's go on to talk about uh, cultural evolution. OK. So uh, it seems that, like uh, cultural evolution is a, is a slightly funny thing for a, a psychologist to be interested in. right? It sounds like something which is kind of part of anthropology or maybe part of biology. When we're used to thinking about biological, um, uh, when we're used to thinking about evolution, we're used to thinking about it in the context of biology. But the reason why I got interested in cultural evolution, and in particular cultural transmission of information, is that in these processes of cultural transmission, the information which is being transmitted is passing through human minds. Right? When we think about approaching, uh, if you think about biological evolution, there's a very different story there. Right? 
In biological evolution, processes of transmission are kind of boring, right? They're fun but boring, right? Um, so, you know, they're processes in which there's uh, essentially copying with some underlying errors. And the real work that happens in evolution, in biological evolution, comes from selection, right? From, from you know, the, the sort of forces which are acting in the environment to shape the structure of organisms. In cultural evolution, the mechanisms of transmission are actually quite interesting. So what happens is, you know, as you receive data from another person, uh, and those data inform the hypotheses that, that you form, right? As you hear a language and then you know, form a hypothesis about the structure of the language yourself, uh, the thing which is involved in that process is your memory and your ability to learn and all of the other things that are the sort of cognitive processes that we study as psychologists. So, there's actually an interesting opportunity here as a psychologist uh, who, who you know, becomes interested in something like cultural evolution to offer a very different perspective on what the kinds of forces are which are at work in forming the, uh, the sort of cultural objects in human societies. In particular, you can have uh, the, the, the view that you know, this process of transmission, which is much richer than the processes that are involved in biological evolution, could as a consequence have a much stronger uh, effect on the things that emerge from processes of cultural evolution. Um, and so this is the question that we engage with, is the question about what happens when information is transmitted via a mechanism like this. Uh, and this is an interesting question to ask when you start to think about what sorts of objects are transmitted in this way. So I said, you know, one of my examples of something which is transmitted via this kind of process of iterated learning is language, right? You learn language from someone who learns language, who learns language, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, and language is a, a, a sort of canonical instance of a cultural object. It's something which you can really only learn from other people. It's not something which exists in the world. There are other kinds of cultural objects like this. For example, religion, right? The religious concepts that you learn are religious concepts that you learn from somebody who learned concepts from somebody and so on and so on, right? If the way that you learn what's holy in your, uh, your culture is by someone going around and saying, yeah, that's sacred, don't touch that, don't play with that, that's sacred, right? You're kind of engaging in a process of learning which is generalizing beyond the examples that are being provided. Or if you think about how you learn something like a social convention, again, it's an object which only exists as a cultural object. Uh, if you think about how you learned that you clap at the end of talks, you probably went to your first talk as an undergrad or a beginning grad student, you saw that people clapped and you said, okay, that's how people you know, end talks. If you were in a different country or a different community, right? So uh, in Switzerland, people knock on the table, right? Uh, and in the deaf community, people will uh, wave their hands, right? There are other kinds of social conventions that tell you what you do at the end of a talk. Um, and uh, you know, the way that you figure out what the right one is is through a learning experience based on the behavior of other people. So these kinds of objects, languages, concepts, and uh, social conventions are also things where people have made strong claims about the relationship that might exist between those cultural objects and human minds. So for example, for languages, if you look across human languages, you see that they're not just an arbitrary set of possible, you know, of all the possible communication schemes, but rather seem to have some systematic structure and there are what are called linguistic universals or at least, you know, sort of typological regularities that appear in the structure of human languages. And those regularities have been asserted to be something which reflects something about the structure of how it is that, you know, our, our mechanisms for learning language might work. Or if you look at uh, religious concepts, there have been similar kinds of claims that if you look across human societies, you see common structure in human religions, and that that common structure is in part a consequence of the way that human minds work. Or social conventions, likewise, people have argued that the social conventions that persist in human societies are ones that somehow align with, say, deep-seated emotional uh, uh, um, emotional components. So for example, the moral conventions that persist tending to be ones that align with our emotions, the things that, that, uh, that uh, elicit disgust, right? So in each of these cases, there's an argument about how these things, these cultural objects, which are arguably the result of processes of cultural transmission, uh, might uh, be something which is uh, reflecting the structure of human minds. Uh, but most of these claims that have been made are kind of at the level of verbal theories. And it would be nice if we were able to nail down exactly what kind of relationship we should expect to see between cultural objects and the minds that are involved in transmitting them. So in order to do that, we need to have a theory of those processes of transmission, right? A theory of processes of learning and memory and the things that are actually going on inside human heads when, when uh, information is being transmitted in this way. Uh, and so, it's not going to surprise you at this point in the talk that I'm going to suggest that we could do that by, say, assuming that our learners here are actually little Bayesian agents, right? 
uh, and then analyzing what the consequences of cultural transmission via a sequence of Bayesian agents is. And so in a bunch of results with uh, uh, Mike Kalish, we actually uh, performed these analyses. And the basic uh, sort of setup in, in one of our, our, in our sort of standard model of this is to say, well, you imagine that you're seeing data you calculate a posterior distribution, right? And then you uh, generate a sample from that distribution as your hypothesis. Then based on that hypothesis, you generate new data from the corresponding likelihood function. You sample from the posterior, you sample from the likelihood function, and so on. And this defines a stochastic process. We can analyze the properties of that stochastic process. And we can prove that the probability that a learner chooses a particular hypothesis converges to the prior probability of that hypothesis as the chain gets longer. So here, we assume that all of our agents have the same prior distribution, right? And then that prior distribution is essentially shaping the hypotheses that they end up with. And the longer that sort of process of transmission takes place, it doesn't matter what data you start with over here, you're going to end up converging to something which reflects just the prior distribution that the learners had, OK? So this is interesting in the context of cultural evolution, right? It says that. Uh, we should expect the cultural objects that are transmitted through human minds to take on a form which is consistent with the structure of those human minds. In particular, the kinds of languages and concepts and conventions that we end up with should be those ones which are easy for us to learn or easy for us to remember or you know, otherwise consistent with the expectations that we have and the constraints that guide human learning. It says that our inductive biases should be expressed in the cultural objects that we create. Um, and it also suggests that you could make some inferences about the structure of those inductive biases by looking at the properties of those cultural objects. But I think uh, even perhaps more interestingly, it gives us a solution to the problem that I started out the talk with, right? It gives us a way that we can identify what people's inductive biases are like. You can take this process uh, and rather than sort of letting it you know, run in the wild and looking at what the consequences are in, in, you know, in the, the wider world, you can take it into the laboratory and run it in the laboratory and look at what kinds of things come out of this process when we simulate cultural evolution. Right? So if we simulate these processes of cultural transmission using sort of the naturalistic inductive problems that uh, we're, we actually care about estimating human priors for, we can look at what the products are that emerge from those transmission processes and then say something about what human priors are going to be like. It gives us a scheme for sampling from those uh, prior distributions. So before I sort of go into that in more detail, uh, a little bit more explanation about why this happens. So a good intuitive explanation is we started out with data here, then we you know, form a posterior distribution, right? And then we generate some data, we form a posterior distribution. Every time you apply Bayes' rule, what that's doing is it's kind of moving the hypotheses that you end up with a little bit closer to the prior distribution, right? So the prior has an effect every time you perform Bayesian inference. And the only distribution which is invariant to that effect is the prior itself, right? The only thing that can't be made closer to the prior is the prior. And so that's why what happens over time is you get pulled closer and closer and closer to the prior in terms of the hypotheses that the agents are selecting. And as a consequence, you end up with the prior distribution being the, the, the thing that comes out of this process, right? There's also a more formal explanation. Um, so uh, this is actually what we're doing here is we're sampling from two conditional distributions, which are the conditional distributions of a single joint distribution. And so as a consequence, this defines a, a kind of Markov chain that's called a Gibbs sampler. It's a Markov chain that's used in computer science in Markov chain Monte Carlo al as, a, as a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. That is, it's an algorithm which is kind of designed to converge to a particular distribution. And the distribution it converges to here is the one in which the hypotheses that we select, we select with, our uh, with the, uh, the corresponding prior probability. Um, so the deeper idea here, from the perspective of estimating what human prior distributions is like, is that we're running a Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation using people, right? We're running our Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm uh, to generate samples from this complex probability distribution, which is the prior distribution that's inside people's heads. So normally, computer scientists run Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms to sample from complex distributions that are represented on a computer. And what we're going to do here is use exactly that same approach to generate samples from a complex distribution that just happens to be represented you know, inside your head rather than, uh, than on, a, on a digital computer. So this is a cool idea. I was very excited about it. We were all set to run, go off and run a bunch of experiments. Uh, and then it turned out we'd been scooped. Uh, fortunately, we'd been scooped about 80 years ago uh, by this guy, Frederick Bartlett, uh, who had run a whole bunch of these studies. And if you've taken introductory psychology classes, you've probably heard about Bartlett's studies. Bartlett did a bunch of studies on what he called serial reproduction. The most famous one is the War of the Ghosts. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> 
Yeah, he looked at how a story changed as it was transmitted from person to person, um, where each person would read the story and then write it out again from memory. This is another one of his experiments. The first person came in and saw this owl. Uh, this was then taken away, and they had to draw it from memory. That reproduction was given to the next person, who had to draw it from memory, and this is what they produced. And then that was given to the next person, who had to reproduce it, and so on, and so on, and so on. You can see the owl turns into a cat, right? Uh, so I think from this we can make a strong conclusion that human beings have an inductive bias towards cats. Right? <laughs> uh, consistent with this, if you take a neural network and you train it on YouTube, it does find a cat detector, right? So uh, you know, you, if you take YouTube as your representation of the kinds of cultural objects that people might value, then cats are clearly highly represented there. No, but I mean, really what we want to do is a more quantitative kind of experiment hopefully one where we know what kind of prior distribution we should expect to converge to as a means of testing out the basic prediction that this account makes. And so uh, with Mike Kalish and Steve Lewandowski, we've run a bunch of experiments like this. Here is one of these experiments. Um, in these experiments, we tend to use pretty boring tasks because those are tasks that psychologists know about, and so we know something about people's inductive biases. So here, uh, this is a function learning task. The data you get is some XY pairs. You're trying to figure out an underlying function. So each learner is going to see a set of XY pairs. I'll show you exactly how we present those in a moment. They then make predictions of the value of Y for some new X values. And we take the predictions that are made by one learner as the data that we give to the next learner. right? And then their predictions go to the next learner, and so on and so on. So the actual format of this experiment, here is X. It's the width of this blue bar. Here is Y. It's the height of this yellow bar. And then this uh, red bar here is the way that you enter a response. So what happens is you see the blue bar. You don't see the yellow bar. You just see the red bar. You adjust the red bar to where you think the yellow bar is going to be. You hit a button, and then the yellow bar shows up. If you're close enough, you go on to the next trial. If you missed by a fair amount, then you need to do it again. You adjust the red bar to where the yellow bar is, and then you go on to the next trial. Okay? So you do that 50 times, and then you do it 50 times where you don't get to see the yellow bar. And those 50, uh, that second 50, that's your predictions, which are then the data we give to the next person. So as I said, it's a pretty boring task. The reason why we use this boring task is that about 40 years of psychological research has shown that the easiest thing to learn here, right, the thing that people should have you know, under a Bayesian account highest prior probability for, the thing that they sort of have the strongest inductive bias in favor of, is uh, as this bar gets wider, this bar gets taller, right? Positive linear relationship. Next easiest. This bar gets wider, this bar gets shorter, negative linear relationship, right? And then basically after that, everything goes to hell, right? So uh, any uh, nonlinear relationships require you know, more than the 50 examples we give people in order for them to learn, something which is you know, sort of a relatively uh, difficult thing for people to learn, and as a consequence, something we think about as having a low prior probability. So this sets up an ordering in terms of the kinds of functions we think people are biased towards. Uh, and then what we should do is, uh, look at the consequences of iterated learning using different initial data with the prediction that we should be converging to something that reflects these biases over time. Yeah? Yeah, I, I don't understand the experiment. Can you just summarize? Yeah. Here? Just, you mean like what this task is again? So what are you doing here? Okay, so people are uh, coming in, they're just learning the relationship between the width of this bar and the height of this bar, okay? And so the way that we do that is they, uh, they see this blue bar. They don't see the yellow bar. They adjust the red bar to where they think the blue bar is, this is where they think the yellow bar is, based on the information provided by the blue bar. Okay? Uh, and then uh, they get feedback. They see where the yellow bar actually is, and then they can use that to update their estimate and then go on to the next trial. So they're told to find the width of the bar? No, they're told that they're just going to be learning the relationship between these two variables. Right? So they're shown repeatedly bars of different width. Yep. That's right. They go through 50 trials of seeing, seeing the blue bar and then uh, making a prediction about where the yellow bar is going to be. Yeah. Okay. All right. So again, the prediction is uh, that uh, we start out with different initial conditions. We should be converging to something that reflects these biases. Uh, and so I'll show you the results from this experiment. So we ran this. Uh, we did 32 of these different chains with different initial conditions. I'll show you uh, four of them. So here is um, uh, the data that's the initial data used to initialize this chain. And here are the predictions of that first learner. Right. And then we take those predictions as the data we give to the second learner, and then we get this. These are their predictions. Those are the data for the next learner, right? Here are their predictions, and so on. OK, so positive linear function successfully transmitted across our generations here. Uh, let's see what happens with a negative linear function. Uh huh. And yeah, in fact, it doesn't really matter what you start out with. Uh, it's a nonlinear function or just random noise, right? So uh, we did this. 
as I said, 32 times, 28 of those 32 times we got our positive linear function out, and then the other four times we got a negative linear function out, but that's consistent with the biases that I was talking about, right? Okay, so, you know, one thing is good, you know, this is consistent with the predictions of the theoretical account I was presenting. It does suggest that the kinds of things that emerge from cultural transmission should be things that reflect our inductive biases, they reflect how easy or hard it is to learn different kinds of things. But the other thing, if you look at this and you're a cognitive psychologist, is that this is a really good way of running an experiment, right? So as I said, 40 years of research had determined that people have a bias towards positive linear functions, but those 40 years of research had just run a single generation of participants, right? And if you look here, you can kind of see that there's a positive linear bias. Look, you know, here they get the least errors are on the positive linear case. When they make errors, they go in the positive linear direction. They impose positive linear structure on things that don't have positive linear structure. So if you squint at those data, you can see that there's a positive linear bias there. But if you look over here, it's much more apparent, right? So Iterated learning is something which basically establishes a feedback process. You're taking the data from people and then feeding it back as input and then it comes out as output again and feeding it back and feeding it back. And that feedback process is something which magnifies whatever the small effects were in the initial data. So if you're interested in studying something where you know, you've got what's fundamentally a small effect and you want to blow it up, right? this is kind of like a magnifying glass or a microscope. It's a tool that you can use to actually run experiments which can find behavioral phenomena at much higher resolution just by establishing these kinds of feedback processes. Okay, we've run other experiments where we look at more quantitative kinds of priors. Uh, here's a version of the predicting the future task where we iterate. So again, we give people information about how much money a movie has made. We ask them to guess how much money the movie is going to make. And then uh, they're seeing values of t, making predictions of t total. And then on a subsequent trial, we're now actually running this experiment within subjects. So we're, we're choosing a subsequent trial for each participant based on the data they provided on an earlier trial. So there's no, no requirement that we actually transmit across people. We're now sort of doing transmission within people. Um, uh, the next value of t that they see is chosen uniformly between 0 and the value of t total that they selected on a previous trial. So this is consistent with that assumption that I was, I was mentioning before. So now, because we're running this within subjects, we get these nice chains for each individual subject. So here's a chain for movie grosses and poems for one of our subjects. So we start out over dispersed with a wide range of values. And then you can see pretty quickly those values uh, uh, end up converging together into the same kind of range. Uh, and then we just take the second half of the responses for each of our participants. We aggregate those across participants. And then we look at the distribution of those things. Uh, that's basically our prediction for what people's prior distribution should be like compared to the actual distribution of those quantities in the world. And so this is for. Uh, grosses of movies, the length of poems, human lifespans, the reigns of Egyptian pharaohs, run times of movies, how long it takes to bake a cake. Uh, so the scales here are different across the columns. These are the true distributions. These are the estimated distributions we get from people. Uh, and then the scales are the same you know, down here. So what you should be able to see is that the forms of these distributions that we're getting out are actually a pretty good match for the empirical distributions of these quantities, which is consistent with you know, what I was talking about before, where we were saying that it seems like people are acting in a way where they're using an appropriate kind of prior for making these sorts of predictions. OK. So these two experiments are kind of validation experiments. They confirm that what we get out is something which reflects whatever the, the sort of inductive biases are that people might bring in. So then there are two kinds of ways in which we can use iterated learning. So one way is to answer questions about cultural evolution. So for example, we can examine questions about the origin of universals. You can ask whether cultural transmission might be sufficient to account for the cultural and linguistic universals. Right? And remember, this is a kind of controversial idea in the context of studying cultural evolution. This is the idea that you come to as a cognitive psychologist who wants to study cultural evolution. If you are coming at it from a sort of biological angle and thinking about biological evolution as the sort of canonical case, then transmission is not something you're not necessarily going to give a lot of thought to. And you're going to think about these things as reflecting something Thing about mechanisms of selection. The other question we can ask is uh, what human prior distributions are like, right? So this gives us, as I said, a tool for answering my big question of what human inductive biases are. And we can use this as an experimental tool for answering that question. So I'm going to give you one example of each of these approaches. Uh, uh, sorry, one example of how we use this approach to, to engage with each of these questions. So, the first example is uh, looking at a case where we have well-documented universals and where there are competing theories about where those universals might come from. So this is the case of color terms. 
So if you look at the way in which uh, human languages divide up the space of colors, there are clear regularities in this. For example, if you have a language where you just have two color terms, then the basic distinction is something like a, a light-dark distinction. You know, one term kind of covers the, the light colors and one term co covers the dark colors. Um, if you have a third term, then you add in uh, something which covers the red colors. So you sort of have a lightish, darkish term and a red term. And then as you add, you know, four and five and so on, there are consistent regularities about what kinds of terms appear in, in human languages. So there have been two kinds of arguments about where this might come from. One is that these regularities just reflect something about human perceptual and learning biases, right? The things I've been calling inductive biases. Something about the way we perceive colors and something about the way that we learn categories. The other argument is that these categories emerge as a consequence of communicative constraints. That is, that we need to communicate with one another about certain kinds of things in the world, and uh, as a, we need to be able to communicate in a way which is consistent with one another, and as a consequence, we end up with having colors which have a particular structure. So we can examine uh, whether just cultural transmission, bringing out these perceptual and learning biases, might be sufficient to uh, uh, account for these universals by basically running an iterated learning experiment where we look at whether what comes out of iterated learning reflects the same kinds of patterns as the patterns that we see in the universals. So in this experiment, what we did is basically take, this is the, uh, the color array, which is used in the World Color Survey, which is a survey of 110 pre-industrial societies asking people to, to uh, give uh, labels to each of these color chips. Um, and so what we do is we take some of the colors from this and we label those as you know, being referred to by one term. Uh, we take some of the other colors, we label those as being referred to by the other term, and then we ask people to complete their labeling of the array, right? So they just, you know, we'd ask them for every other color what term they think will label it. Um, so uh, when we do this, um, we use between two and six labels. So we're using English speakers, we're running this experiment in the lab, uh, and those English speakers are coming in, you know, already knowing English. Uh, so one of the things that we want to do is minimize the amount of interference that they have from the color categories that they already know by forcing them to use a smaller number of color categories than the ones that they're used to using. So uh, we do this between two and six terms. Uh, and then the predictions that they make, so they give us a fully labeled array, are then used to generate the examples that are provided to the next person. So if you came in and did this experiment, this is with six terms, it would look something like this. Here are a bunch of different terms, prisk, nooked, glance, swells, uh, ginst, and gorge, right? And then these are examples of things that have been labeled with uh, that term, and then you have to decide what you're going to name this particular color. So the way I'm going to show you these data is using the world color survey array here, uh, and then using pseudocolors to show how this array is partitioned. So with two terms, I'm just going to use black and white, three terms, black, white, and red, four terms, black, white, red, and yellow. And so these colors just indicate uh, the, the terms that are applied to different chips. Okay? Uh, so we start out with a completely random allocation of terms to chips, and then we select from that examples which are used to teach our first learners. They come in, they're a bit confused, right? Uh, but they're imposing a little bit of order here. And then their, their labels are used to generate the labels for the next person. You can see some more structure emerging. Here's three generations. And then you know, after about five generations, you can see we've settled into some pretty consistent uh, schemes for labeling these things, although those schemes continue to change over time, which is consistent with the idea that this is a Markov chain that's kind of exploring the space of color terms. So at the bottom here, I have uh, languages from the World Color Survey, um, or in this case, supplemented with one additional language, uh, which have the same number of terms as these different chains uh, that have been selected to be the thing which is closest to each of these different chains. And so what you can see here, this is a two-term language. And this two-term language basically makes the same kinds of distinctions as the distinctions that show up with our two-term uh, chain here. So basically, a light-dark distinction, or a this is red versus other colors distinction, which is shown here. If you actually look at the two-term language, it has some element of both of those. And so these are the kinds of solutions that people produce for two terms. For three terms, we get solutions which are a kind of light, dark, and red. So here's red, here's light, here's dark. Uh, these blue dots, light blue dots, indicate a minority term, one which is used for less than 5% of the chips. But it's the same kind of structure where you've got sort of red versus other things, and then you have a sort of light dark structure. And this is what we see in three term languages in the World Color Survey. And then this is the same thing for four and five and six. It gets a little more complicated. The way we actually analyze these data is using a quantitative measure 
of the similarity between partitions of a set of elements. So uh, we take these, uh, the speakers of this language, say, uh, we take an individual speaker of that language, we look at how they partition the space, and then we use this metric, which is called variation of information, to compare how distant they are from other speakers within the World Color Survey, and also from the participants in the lab. And then we can plot that over uh, iterations. So this is showing the variation of information. Higher is bad, higher is more distant. Uh, and what you can see is that the variation of information from our chains to the World Color Survey is decreasing here, it stabilizes after about five generations. And then the black line shows the, uh, the distance that you get if you just select two randomly selected members of the World Color Survey and you compare how similar they are to one another. So basically, um, the people in our experiment are coming as close to the World Color Survey as two randomly selected World Color Survey speakers over time. So we're basically seeing movement towards something which is becoming more consistent with the regularities that are expressed across these different human languages uh, as a function of the number of iterations that we're performing, consistent with the idea that these perceptual and learning biases might play a significant role in generating the regularities that we see in those data. So, the second example I'm going to do is one where we're estimating human prior distributions in a case where there's much more controversy and much more complexity to the structure of those priors. And this case is causal learning. So in a causal learning experiment, um, uh, you provide people with some data about the relationship between two variables, say in the form of contingency table. So you see basically how uh, often an effect occurs in the presence and the absence of a cause. The hypotheses that we ask people to consider in this experiment are about the strength of those relationships. So uh, they are estimating two things. One is the background rate, how likely it is that the effect will occur in the absence of the cause. The other is the strength of the cause, how likely it is that the cause will make the effect happen. Right? Um, and so these are things that we can uh, define formally using a, a probabilistic graphical model. Um, and they're things that we can ask people to generate intuitively using some cunningly constructed questions about the probabilities of different events. I'll show you an example in a moment. But the basic idea is that we show people contingency data, they give us estimates of these two strengths, and then the contingency data that they see on a subsequent trial are sampled with the uh, probabilities that correspond to the answers that they gave us on the previous trial. The reason why it's interesting to look at priors here is that there's been a fair amount of controversy about what sorts of expectations people might have about causal relationships. So this is uh, one claim that's been made about the nature of these, uh, uh, these uh, priors. So this is called the sparse and strong hypothesis. The idea is that people might think that only one cause could be strong that either the background is strong or the cause is strong. But basically it's a kind of argument for um, uh, sufficiency that for any situation, for any causal situation, you think that there should be only one cause, which is a strong cause of that effect. And so that produces a distribution that looks kind of like this. Here's the strength of the cause, W1. Here's the strength of the background, W0. And this says you have high probability when W1 is high and W0 is low, or W0 is high and W1 is low. And then there's a similar thing for preventive causes. That's the cases where uh, the presence of the cause actually decreases the probability that the effect occurs. Um, so you could contrast this with other claims that show up in the literature. For example, the idea that people just have an expectation that causes are near deterministic, which would predict a different kind of function here. Um, or in some early models that we used, they just made an assumption that uh, this prior is uniform over these possibilities. But actually exploring the space of all of these different functions is very complicated. There is you know, infinitely many of them. And so it would be nice if we had a way of estimating what priors were without allowing us to do parametric variation of these different distributions. And so that's what we use iterated learning for. So the structure of the actual task that we use, this is an example where we're asking people with a biomedical cover story. We tell them that uh, there's a protein which may or may not cause gene expression. Uh, so these are uh, DNA strands that were not exposed to the protein, and this is how many of them are uh, active. Uh, and then this, uh, how, how many of them the gene is active. And then this is DNA strands that were exposed to the protein. This is how many of them uh, the gene was active. And then we say, uh, this is, so to estimate W0, we just ask them out of 100 here to estimate how many will be active. And then to estimate W1, we say, suppose there's a sample of 100 DNA strands and that the gene is currently off in all those DNA strands. If these 100 strands were exposed to the protein, in how many of them would the gene be turned on? Okay? So this is a counterfactual question uh, that turns out to be a good way of eliciting the estimate of the strength of the cause. So equipped with those probabilities, we then generate the data that's seen on a subsequent trial. We do that many, many times. At the end of the trial, sorry, at the end of each chain, we get a single sample from this distribution, which should be our prior distribution over causal strength. And when we aggregate those samples together, this is what we get. 
So this is uh, a picture of people's empirical distribution over causal strengths. And what it looks like is, first of all, nothing like the sparse and strong prior, right? Uh, it says people really don't care much about the strength of the background, but they think that the cause is deterministic, right? They think that causes uh, produce their effects with very high probability. Uh, and they think that generative causes produce their effects with higher probability than preventive causes suppress them, right? That something which makes you know, E happen does so with a higher probability than something that prevents E from happening. Okay. Uh, so it doesn't look like sparse and strong. I think you could summarize this as strong, not sparse. right? Uh, and it's something which we can then not just sort of have a picture of like this, but use in our Bayesian models of causal induction. So uh, we ran a second experiment where we collected a large benchmark data set of people's judgments of the strength of causal relationships for different contingencies. So this is showing the number of times the effect occurs in the presence of the cause. This is the number of times the effect occurs in the absence of the cause. Uh, and then the brightness shows how strong people thought the causal relationship was. We can make Bayesian models that use different prior distributions, a uniform prior, sparse and strong prior, or this empirically estimated prior. And we can look at the predictions that they make about the estimates of causal strength in each of these different contingencies. And what you can see, I think, just looking at this, is that the empirical prior is actually doing a better job of capturing the pattern that we see here. Um, we can quantify this a little more. This is looking at the difference in fit between the empirical prior and the sparse and strong prior. So anything which is blue is fit better by the empirical prior. Anything which is, fit, uh, is in red is fit, fit better by the sparse and strong prior. And you should be able to see there's a lot of blue up there. right? So what we actually get out of this is the best model of human causal induction that's ever been published. Right? It's, it, it just sort of blows away the competition in terms of making predictions of uh, the strength of what, what people will assess as the strength of a causal relationship. And that's something which you know, not just gives us insight into human causal learning, but gives us something that we can take and we can put into machine learning systems that try and identify causal relationships from data. So we've used this kind of method for a bunch of other uh, kinds of um, uh, problems where we might be interested in estimating what human prior distributions are like. But I think the bigger message here is that really this is an instance of a different way of thinking about collecting data about human behavior. Right? So one big idea is if you're interested, even if you're just interested in understanding individual human cognition, uh, you can get more leverage on that as a consequence of thinking about these cases of what happens when you know, groups are working together or information is being passed along chains of people. But I think the other thing is that uh, this link between sort of methods for estimating psychologically interesting quantities and the sorts of algorithms that computer scientists use for, say, generating samples from complex probability distributions suggests a really different way of approaching the problem of doing psychology experiments. So this is the first psychology lab. This is Wundt's lab. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, you know, this could plausibly be uh, you know, a psychology lab today. right? People come in, they're doing some tasks with some complex apparatus. OK, maybe we need to make it a little more complex. right? Uh, <laughs> But you know, now, I think, right, it looks pretty much right. You know, we're used to kind of thinking about experiments in the context of you know, bringing small numbers of people into the lab and studying extensively what it is that they do in, uh, in a, a task that might give us information about you know, a small number of uh, uh, hypotheses that we're entertaining about human cognition. But this picture has changed a little bit more in the last few years. Right? Uh, now it's more likely that they're doing something like this, right? that they're running large-scale experiments online. But I think uh, we as psychologists haven't necessarily explored all of the implications of that for the way in which we practice psychology. So having access to more participants doesn't just mean that we should run more experiments or we should collect more data to get higher precision estimates of the small number of things that we normally ask questions about. Um, and I think the, uh, the, the bigger sort of question here is whether there are data intensive methods that give us a richer picture of cognition than these traditional psychological methods. So this is, uh, Britt was saying, I wrote this manifesto, right? This is what my manifesto is about. It's that it's saying that we as psychologists need to cast a wider net in the way that we think both about methods and the way that we think about sources of data for evaluating the kinds of theories that we come up to. And one way to address that is to look to computer science and statistics. So I think of you know, this sort of uh, iterated learning method as an instance of what we, can, uh, what we can do when we start to think about innovative methods for running experiments that are based on the sorts of algorithms that computer scientists use, replacing the elements in those algorithms that are normally served by uh, computers with you know, elements that correspond to people. Okay, so three conclusions. So first of all, 
Uh, if we analyze cultural transmission by Bayesian agents, it shows that human minds should have a substantial impact on the information that they transmit. Right? And this gives us a story that we can tell about how it is that the objects of cultural transmission might relate to the structure of human minds. Second, iterated learning itself is a method for magnifying small effects and is something that lets us measure human inductive biases with implications for you know, how we could go about building better machine learning systems. And finally, as we get access to more participants through methods like crowdsourcing, we should be designing experiments to give us a richer picture of human cognition. And I think one way to do that is by thinking about not just sort of the traditional methods of statistical experiment design, but the kinds of methods that computer scientists have developed for uh, making algorithms for querying complex systems. So thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Oh, yeah. Um, so, right, this is uh, really interesting. And, but one thing that I noticed when you were doing your first example of um, inferring a prior yeah. is you did uh, experiments across people and then you uh, aggregated the human right. data to get the prior. So, what you were saying you want to do is actually you know, do these kinds of experiments to learn more about individual cognition. Right. But when you take that approach, what you're sort of learning about is more like group cognition. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering, did you do this for individuals? Like, can you gather enough data that you can actually estimate a prior? For yeah, you can in principle. Um, so we, we've done that with some other. Um, so we, like I said, we're kind of you know with this general view of thinking about uh, human cognition, uh, studying human cognition using tools that come from computer science, right? Um, so so for iterated learning, we have. Uh, we have we've run so that like the predicting the future experiment that I talked about we ran a whole bunch of within subjects things and we can get sort of noisy estimates of individual priors from that um, we've not done a whole lot with those but we've looked at what the properties of the individual chains are and those, those chains themselves the structure of those chains can help to rule out some alternative theories um, uh, but yeah in principle you could collect a, a very comprehensive kind of picture of what an individual's uh, beliefs would be about a particular quantity. For another kind of algorithm we use, um, so this is another kind of Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, uh, which is based on a Metropolis Hastings algorithm. So the way that this works, we say, uh, basically it's a method that you can use for sampling from uh, distribution which corresponds to any uh, subjectively represented non-negative quantity. So one such quantity is, say, uh, the extent to which you think that something belongs to a category, right? So if we say you've got a, uh, a category like, say, frogs being represented by a probability distribution over objects, if you can construct a task where people are making a choice between a discrete number of alternatives where um, the probability that they choose one of those things is proportional to its probability in the category, right? So we say, you know, which animal is a frog or which is the better frog or something like that. As long as they're making choices, I'll point at this one if you want. Uh, as long as they're making choices which are um, proportional to the probability under the category, then we can construct an algorithm which will give us back samples from that category distribution. And so the way that this works um, is using the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. We uh, show people um, uh, two, the two things, they make a choice. Then on a subsequent trial, we take the one that they chose and we show them a variant on that. We ask them the same question, they make a choice. And then on a subsequent trial, we show them that together with a variant, they make a choice. We record which choices they're making each time. And over time, that distribution of responses converges to the distribution that we want to get samples from. So we've used this approach for um, uh, one of the tests that we did was actually looking at um, sampling from uh, n natural categories, things that people already had when they walked into the lab in terms of categories. Uh, so this is a category of animals defined in a nine-dimensional space of quadrupeds, right? So we have different things that correspond to angles and so on. Um, uh, and uh, so what happens is we initialize our chains in some part of the space. This is just a two-dimensional projection. And then they sort of walk around randomly for a bit, and they end up converging to one region of the space across those different chains. And then we can look at what the samples are that correspond to that region. So this is all data from a single subject. Um, so this is one subject's categories for giraffes, horses. Uh, this is cats and dogs, right? And so then we can compute statistics from those kinds of things. We can get like marginal distributions. We can learn that, you know, uh, it turns out dogs have longer necks than cats. You know, there's a lot of information that you can kind of read off. And so this is an alternative to methods like reverse correlation or um, categorization images, which only give you information about the mean of a category. Here we're getting full distributional information out. <coughs>
So uh, yeah, this is one subject responses. These are responses for just you know, a bunch of individual subjects. And you can see individual subject variation. So subject number four has never been to a zoo. Is that right? No, so, no, sub, yeah. So our subject number five here, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, whereas most of these other ones look kind of <laughs> roughly right. OK, any questions? Yeah. Maybe this is implicit what you said. I, I somehow missed it. Uh, in the predict, the predict in the Future section, when the people were shown, I guess, sensitivity to these different distributions, the, you know, the, the, yeah. the power distribution, the galaxy, and the right. where does that come from? Yeah. And, and are they representing it as such, or could there be, like a, I guess, a more approximate heuristic that's generating it? OK. You know, like, like for these kinds of things, approximately double. Yeah. Uh, so, it, it, so you know, the data that I showed don't don't answer that question, right? Um, and you you could dig down and you could try and figure out what the mechanisms are. Um, so, some clues about this. One interesting clue was when we actually did the Egyptian pharaohs example. Um, people were systematically wrong. Um, they were systematically wrong in that they tended to uh, they had the right form for the distribution. So they had the same form as for the U.S. congressman, which was the right one. Um, uh, but they had the wrong parameter, so they basically overestimated the lifespan of people in ancient Egypt, right? So, um, you know, that suggests that there, there might be sort of at least two parts of that sensitivity. One is sensitivity to what kind of thing this is, which then determines what kind of prediction rule you should be using, and the other is sensitivity to something about the parameter of that process, right? Um, uh, so there was this other question about, you know, what mechanisms might support this, right? Um, so. Another very simple mechanism that can allow you to behave in a way which is consistent with Bayesian inference in this case is if you, um, uh, if you walk around the world and you remember what you see, right? Um, you store those things in memory. And then when you have a question come up, you retrieve those things which are most similar to the, you know, the example that's provided, right? And you rule out anything which is less than that example because that's not a valid answer. Um, then uh, that turns out to be a fine way of solving this problem. So that's an exemplar model. And you can prove that exemplar models will approximate Bayesian inference if you, uh, if you sample from the prior, right? So in a situation where the prior you want to use is the actual distribution you encounter in the world, and then um, you reactivate those stored examples with a similarity function that corresponds to the likelihood function. So the similar, if, if those two things are true, then uh, an exemplar model will approximate Bayesian inference. And it does so because it, it turns out to be a kind of approximation that corresponds to a Monte Carlo algorithm called important sampling. So um, it's a way, important sampling is a scheme for um, generating uh, samples from a complex distribution where you, you don't have a way of sampling from the complex distribution, but you sort of get around it by sampling from a simpler distribution. Um, and I can show you a picture. But the, the key idea is that, um, so here's our nasty distribution, right? Here's our nice distribution. We generate samples from the, uh, the nice distribution, but we reweight those to reflect the fact that we're oversampling in some regions and undersampling in others. And then it turns out this is how you should set the weights. And then you just you know, calculate with the, the, the normalized weights um, as, as your sort of approximation to the original distribution. So if you do this for Bayesian inference, the approximation that you get, if you sample from the prior, um, uh, is this one where the algorithm is sample from the prior, weight by the likelihood. It's called likelihood weighting. Uh, and that's essentially what you're doing if you're applying a, an exemplar model. Um, you know, your, your samples are the things you've stored in memory, and then your, your activation function is the analog of the weighting function. Yeah. So, so I think, I think you know, there are very simple sort of memory-based mechanisms that could suffice to produce these things, but you, know, you, just, you have to do good cognitive psychology to figure out exactly what people are doing in these experiments. Thank you.